Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. The morning after the first night of the Republican convention, there are 69 days to go until the general election. So I, I thought that the convention last night mixed moments of pretty slick production with the usual dystopian visions of the American hellscape under Democratic rule. Um, for whatever reason, they chose Charlie Kirk to kick off the proceedings, declaring that Trump was the uh, bodyguard of Western civilization. And of course, you have Matt Gates warning the Democrats are going to disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home and invite MS-13 to live next door. Because God is my witness. I actually had to go fact check that. I, did he really actually say that? Yes, he did. And of course, we had the star turn from the St. Louis couple who aimed guns at the protesters. And then we had Kimberly Guilfoyle, um, the girlfriend of the first son who was really kind of yelling a lot. Let's 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 play the first cut. This is Kimberly Guilfoyle. President Trump believes in you. He emancipates and lifts you up to live your American dream. You are capable. You are qualified. You are powerful and you have the ability to choose your life and determine your destiny. OK, and then, of course, there was a warning, too, from Kimberly. Trump, in individual and personal responsibility, they want to destroy this country and everything that we have fought for and hold dear. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. Just don't hurt me. Just really be. So joining me to talk about all of this, uh, Tim Alberta from Politico magazine. Tim, welcome back on the podcast. Appreciate it very much. Oh, Charlie, what a day to be with you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> OK, so first of all, look, Kimberly's a professional broadcast person. What, what was with the yelling? I mean, don't don't professional broadcast people know that, OK, if you're, if you're talking in an empty room, eh, it just might seem a little bit jarring to be screaming into the microphone. You know. Look, uh, far be it for me to uh, try and crawl inside the mind of Kimberly Guilfoyle, but I guess my first reaction while watching that speech, Charlie, is still my reaction and my theory this morning, which is that Kimberly Guilfoyle cares about one thing above all, which is you know, Kimberly Guilfoyle, which is, yeah. you know, her, her, her standing, her celebrity, her notoriety, however you want to think about it. I mean, she wants to be known and that's not a new phenomenon with her. And so I think she believed that delivering that speech in Dwight Schrute <laughs> form was the best way to make sure that the next morning everybody was talking about her and yeah, uh, are, and she right? and she succeeded by yeah. the way because this is like my fourth media hit this morning and the, every single person has been asking about Kimberly Guilfoyle and I don't think that would have happened had she just given a subdued performance yeah and, and just a reminder that she actually used to be married to the governor of California, Gavin Newsom. So it's just it's a bizarre story. So I want to talk to you about your amazing piece that everybody's been talking about, the the, the grand old meltdown, um, which you dropped yesterday. And it's 5,000 words of red hot molten, what would you call it? Outrage? Insight? Uh, you you, you describe Tragedy. it. I, 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 yeah, I don't know how. I, yeah. OK, well, let, you know, let's get right into it, because, you know, I, I thought this was more interesting than than actually what happened at the convention last night. So you wrote this piece about what happens when a party loses its its mind, it loses its ideas. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday on the on the podcast, that conversation with Frank Luntz, where you're trying to get him to what does it mean to be a Republican? And he goes, I, did, I don't know. I just I'm, I'll give you an answer if, if, if I have one. Interestingly enough, this drops the same day, Tim, that the Republican Party says, yeah, we're not going to have a platform. We're, we're just going to basically say whatever he wants. Um that really is not a coincidence because essentially what they did was codify exactly what you wrote about in this article, this complete abandonment of any pretense that the Republican Party is about anything other than Donald Trump. Yeah. And on the one hand, I, I, and I promise I'm not even being a smart ass here, Charlie, but on the one hand, you almost applaud the honesty, right? You know, let, let, let's do away with the pretense. I mean, let's let's not pretend that. Yours is a party that cleaves 
uh, you know, the, the, let's not pretend that the modern Republican Party operates on a base of deeply held principles that then sort of trickle down and inform thoughtful, nuanced policy positions that are designed to improve the lives of everyday Americans. I mean, let's just let's do away with that because it's not true. And it's manifestly not true. And look, sometimes in my line of work, people will make it really hard on you. And sometimes they make it really easy. And yesterday is an example of them making it really easy. I mean, if you, you know, if, if, if you wanted to push back on my piece, there were a lot of ways you could have done it. But deciding to just not put out a party platform, it's pretty freaking astonishing if we're being honest with ourselves. I yeah. mean, look, a party platform to some people is this sort of empty symbolic gesture but but and i don't i don't fully subscribe to that although i certainly understand where they're coming from and that it's just a bunch of ideas and statements and missions put on a piece of paper but that piece of paper is for history that piece of paper is meant to you know sort of crystallize and 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 you know this idea that parties were supposed to be about ideas and not people i mean the the the, the policy platform of a party that's put together every four years, that's the embodiment. I mean, that's where a party can sort of fall back on this, on this document and say, look, here's what we believe in. Even if we don't always live up to these things, even if we don't always find the time to act on these things or pursue these things, these are the things that we believe in. And you can go back decades and decades and decades in the archives and find every four years what the party has put on paper. It's a good snapshot in time to understand what the issues of the day were and how a major political party was handling them. The fact that the Republican Party of 2020 didn't feel compelled to do that really speaks volumes about where it is and what it believes, and I think more accurately, what it doesn't believe. So it, let me read you a little bit of, from your article, and then I, want to, I have a very specific question to ask you. And you, you, you quote somebody talking about how in the past, you know, even ornery guys like John Adams um, at least believed in ideas. You know, Thomas Jefferson had a little bit of a, a checkered uh, past, uh, but uh, he at least talked about these ideas, and now it's just regression to the common denominator. And you write, it can now safely be said, as his first term in the White House draws towards closure, that Donald Trump's party is the very definition of a cult of personality. It stands for no special ideal. It possesses no organizing principle. It represents no detailed vision for governing. Filling the vacuum, is a lazy identity-based populism that draws from that lowest common denominator that Mark Sanford, the former congressman, former governor, uh, alluded to. If it agitates the base, if it lights up an, a Fox News chyron, if it serves to alienate sturdy real Americans from delicate coastal elites, then it's got a place in the grand old party. In other words, basically owning the libs and pissing off the media. Okay, so what struck me, what struck me about your your article is it just it felt pent up, Tim. You've been writing about and chronicling the Republican Party for a long time, but this felt like something had been building up inside you that resulted in that article. Am I right? Or what was it? Hmm. I know I'm right. Maybe so I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. you, you're, you're probably right. I'm just, I'm just considering whether I need to go lay down on the couch. Uh, yeah. yeah, look, it, it, it was pent up and, uh, I'll be I'll be real honest with you, Charlie. I don't know how long I am for this world of, of political journalism. There, there's there's a lot of ways I can think to spend my life in more satisfying uh, settings than in you know covering politicians of both parties for that matter. And uh, and I, and I've got you know I've got a lot of thinking to do about what happens after 2020 and what I want to spend my time doing and what makes me happy. And you know. I, I would be remiss if I did not leave everything on the field, so to speak. And uh, I thought I had done that with my book, but there have been additional events over the past you know, year and a half since the book came out that have compelled me to think even, you know, to really sort of scrutinize even more harshly what we are seeing happen. I mean, look, we have a two-party system. In this country, it is not a parliamentary system where you can choose to be a vegetarian or you can choose to be a vegan or you can choose to be a carnivore. These are coalitions that come together and that you're essentially stuck with a binary choice unless you want to go vote Green Party or Libertarian Party. But if you want your vote to have a say really at the end of the day in, in, in electing a president, then you've got to line up between behind one of these two parties. 
And the fact that one of those two choices is now just, uh, I think, so sort of uh, proudly anti-intellectual and so defiant in the face of, you know, uh, it, it, so so defiantly unwilling to speak up for the principles that for my entire life it had proclaimed as its own. Um. It's just, it's disturbing, I guess, for lack of a better word. You know, at the end of the day, it's disturbing and it's distressing. And, you know, I got little kids and I worry a lot about the future of this country. And I wrote, you know, I've written similar pieces that were really sort of dark about Congress, because I think I feel like the the institution of Congress is in is in just as much trouble for a different set of reasons. But the Republican Party is an institution. We talk a lot about institutional collapse in this country, public religion and uh, excuse me, public education and organized religion and all these other institutions. I mean, parties are institutions, man, like parties are vital institutions. And one of these institutions is collapsing in real time, right in front of our eyes. And I don't think that we take it seriously enough. You know, it's interesting that I have had the same conversation several times over the last several days with people who are saying what you're saying, that I've been engaging in political journalism or commentary for years, and I just don't know how long I can keep doing it. It's been just such a soul-crushing experience. How long have you been doing this? You you have been, I mean, you've been covering Congress, um, what, how many years? Many well, years? I came to DC in uh, in '08, um, so and I spent twelve years, yeah, uh, yeah, about twelve years in DC. Um, but I've been in political journalism for about fifteen years. So, and yet you write in this piece that you were genuinely surprised in the course of a lot of conversation with a lot of Republicans at their inability to articulate a purpose, a designation, just a reason for their party. So you were gen- you've been covering this. You've you written American Carnage. You've talked about, you know, the breakdown of, you know, of, of Congress as a as a, you know, as a deliberative body. You've watched the rise of, of Donald Trump. And yet you were why what was it that surprised you? Why surprise after all of this? Because I guess after all of those years and seeing what you have seen and talking to so many people that you would have become jaded. Well, of course this is what it's become. Oh yeah, I mean, look, I'm I'm as I'm as jaded and cynical as they come, and I think well, that's that's to, the, that's to the point of the question you're asking. Well, no, it was just you know it was surprising, I guess, Charlie, just in the sense that uh, you spend enough time around political types, and even when they know they got nothing, they got something, right? Like, in other words, um, even when you know that they're holding a two a four, a six, a nine, and a jack uh, of different suits in their hand, uh, they're still going to play it like they've got a flush, right? They're, they're, mm-hmm. they, they, they're still going to bluff. They're still going to BS. They're still going to come up with something to sell you on the fact that they've got a strong hand to play. And I, you know, even in the process of reporting the book, You would have these conversations with people in the party who, on the one hand, would admit that Trump was uh, sort of running far afield of of everything that they believed in and that they Mm -hmm. were worried about where this was taking us. But on the next hand, they would pivot, even in private settings, and they'd be really optimistic and say, yeah, but look, like I still think that we sort of exert this influence over this guy. And I still think that some of these things that we want to pursue that, you know, that, that, that we can and we will there was just no real pivot in any of these conversations yeah. I was having. I mean, there, there just wasn't, there was almost an acceptance, I guess, Charlie, that's the best way I can put it. There, there was an acceptance of the reality that this is not a party built around ideas, that, yeah. that this is not a party that really stands for anything in particular beyond self-preservation and fidelity to Trump. Well, the reason I asked you why you were surprised, I mean, I wrote a book a few years ago called, you know, How the Right Lost Its Mind, which basically argued that, you know, that, that what was happening was a rejection of of ideas, rejection of the intellectual tradition. And yet I still, I, like you, I find it amazing, the complete rejection of everything. So it, I thought one of the interesting things about your piece, though, was you talk about what they've replaced the ideas with. It's just sort of the fighting for the sake of fighting, squabbling for the sake of, of squabbling. 
Uh, Trump and his party have relied more on squabbles and solutions and delivering their base. The party is defined primarily by its appetite for conflict, even when the conflict serves no obvious policy goal. And then you run through the last month of craziness, all the different fights, everything from, you know, QAnon or, you know, um, you know, Mount Rushmore, or what, what, whatever the you know post office, all, you know, the the argument that the, 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 the I'm sorry, the claim that Biden is against God and will hurt God. And you, what you point out is that none of this actually solves anything. There's there's no there's no connection to anything in the real world. It has just become sort of this performative strutting for its own sake. Yeah, it has. Uh, and, you know, the thing that I observed about it, Charlie, is so many Republicans will fall back on this idea. And when I, you know, I'm talking about Republican elected officials specifically, they will fall back on this idea that, you know what, what at the end of the day, for all of Trump's uh, uncouth behavior and, and all of the offensive rhetoric and everything else, that this guy, he's fighting for ordinary Americans, that he's right. fighting for everyday Joes, he's fighting for them, he's fighting for the little guy. That was a big part of Trump's appeal and understandably so in 2016, because both of these parties had for so long just really neglected uh, the, the everyman in America and, and had catered far more to their interest groups, both on the left and on the right, than to just, you know, your, your sort of average Joe, blue collar, father of three, living somewhere in exurban Milwaukee or exurban Detroit, who's making 60 grand a year and trying to, you know, pay for his kids to, you know, play on the hockey team with his little bit of disposable income. Like those guys felt screwed and they felt ignored and, and they had every reason to feel that way. And so Trump comes along and he exploits that. And he has in many ways achieved this sort of supernatural connection on an emotional level with those voters. And yet when you study everything that has been done over the last three and a half years, it's very, very difficult to find a single instance of how any of this stuff actually benefits tangibly those people. Um, and in many cases, what he's done has actually hurt those people. When you're looking at a, at a trade war or when you're looking at a, a tax plan that ultimately benefits the wealthiest Americans and puts a long term burden on working class families. Like there's, there's just, there's very little in the way of evidence to support the idea that the president is doing anything more for ordinary everyday working class Americans than just sort of kicking up a fight about these kind of cultural wedge issues. And I don't doubt for a minute that, you know, those, that, that, that those culture wars are important to those people and that they care about them. But in terms of actually improving their lives in a substantive way, there's just not really anything to show for it. And that disconnect, I think, is just like really fundamental to understanding, you know, the 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 crossroads that the party is fast approaching here. Because whether Trump wins or Trump loses, you have a lot of Republicans who are trying to figure out, okay, how do we harness that same populist appeal that Trump has, but also, you know, restore some of this intellectual credibility to the party. But it's not going to be that easy because at the end of the day, the Trump populist appeal isn't rooted in policy. It's rooted in emotion. And that's something that's really, really difficult to manufacture if you are not sort of born with that innate ability to, to, to demagogue in the way that Trump demagogues. So I got an email yesterday after I included your piece in my in my newsletter saying um, the Republican Party does actually stand for something. Uh, he said I could articulate it. They're they're for low taxes. They're pro life. They're pro gun, and they want conservative judges. So is is that not enough? Well, so look, I wouldn't deny any of those things, but I don't think that that's standing for something in the sense of uh, again what is the party delivering for voters, right? Like, so so we spent the last three and a half years of the Trump presidency uh, hearing about tax cuts, hearing about conservative judges, uh, and to some degree, I, I suppose, also hearing about, um, uh, you know, pro-life policy and pro-gun policy, although 
not a whole lot. I mean, that was sort of more at the margins. Um, but but this is a re-election campaign. And when you're asking, you know, what are you standing for? What are you fighting for? What are the things that you're going to do if elected in a second term? Then it's very difficult to just fall back on these things that you've already done, yeah. right? That's your record. It's not your vision. And so, yes, I, I, I would agree with with that with that reader that in in a in an almost academic sense that yes the republican party has a baseline of things that they fight for including you know gun rights including uh anti-abortion policy uh including uh lower tax rates there, there's no doubt but that's still those things still don't necessarily a form any part of a sort of coherent ideology that guides how a party governs and B and sort of more relevant to the context of a re-election campaign and a re-nominating convention, they don't offer anything more than what's already been offered. Like they, they, they don't, they don't supplement the party's previous achievements with future promises and future plans. So you have a couple of lines I want to ask you about. So you write, to be a Republican today requires you to exist in a constant state of moral relativism, turning every chance at self-analysis into an assault on the other side, pretending the petting zoo next door is comparable to the three ring, three ring circus on your own front lawn. I love that. But this really is the the, the constant state of moral relativism where Every conversation that I've had, I feel for the last three years with a Republican, immediately switches to what about ism, changing mm -hmm. the subject. Well, yes, everything, even conceding every point you might make, say, yes, but the Democratic Party is so much worse, is so much more dangerous. I mean, that's become that's become a reflex. That That is a way of life. That is the governing principle right now of the Republican Party, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And and, and you call and it, it nihilism, like a form of nihilism. It is. I, well, look, it is. It is. And, and we can get more into that. But, yeah. but to that first point, Charlie, you know, this is where I disagree with people who say, you know, basically what you see from the Republican Party right now with, with the MAGA coalition, it's just an extension of the Tea Party. And I don't entirely agree with that. And I'll tell you why. Because when the Tea Party came into power and when the Tea Party was ascendant, that, that movement was every bit as much about cleaning up in-house and restoring the principles, supposed principles of the Republican Party as it was doing fight again, you know, doing battle with the left, waging war on Obama. And in fact, I think in the early stages when the Tea Party was actually a, a, a more... Um, a more honest and authentic entity at the grassroots level, like it was far more concerned with, you know, um, sort of correcting the mistakes of the Bush era, big government Republican Party and and uh, sort of purifying from within. It was far more invested in that than it was it had a in this idea of fighting vibe. Democrats. It kind of had a reformation vibe to it now that you it, it, it absolutely yeah, 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 it absolutely did. And and and. And obviously, it wound up morphing into something else completely, and and wound Wait. up becoming sort of a, a a punchline with the way that it was inconsistent and self contradictory and, and downright hypocritical. But in those early days, for the first couple of years after Bush left office, you know there was I th and, and really Charlie, I'd even step back further than that. I mean, in Bush's final year in office, with the with um, the sort of rising up against TARP, and with a lot of Republicans beginning to break away from the administration because they felt as though the administration had strayed from conservative principles. I mean, that wasn't an exercise in whataboutism. It was an exercise in examining one's own flaws and sort of wanting to clean up your own house and take the speck out of your own eye right before you look at your neighbor. And so and that's what's puzzling about this iteration of the Republican Party is to your point a minute ago, I mean, man, you can't have a conversation with anyone who who self-identifies as a Republican. I don't care if it's a member of Congress or your buddy when you're having some drinks, you know, watching a baseball game. You cannot have that conversation about the Republican Party and about Trumpism and about the damage being done without that person almost reflexively saying, yeah, but what about these crazy Democrats? Like these, you know, these guys are nuts. They're every bit as bad. These guys are socialists. And it's like, you just want to grab them by the lapels and say, just for a minute, who cares, right? Like who, the, the, you're not a Democrat, right? You, like for, for, for my money, 
if I'm a fan of a, of a, of a football team, and that football team's front office is a complete mess. And I know that that football, that, that football team is sort of uh, stringing together some wins that are ultimately really unsustainable because the front office is making one bad personnel move after another, and they're clearly in over their heads, right? If I were to talk about that with a fellow fan of the team, and they were like, yeah, but, you know, the, yeah, our, our front office is Lions fans. It's a joke. But what about what the Bears are doing? I'd say, yeah. well, what the hell does that matter? I don't – like – you know, don't, we can, we're Lions fans. Don't we want the Lions front office to be, uh, you know, functional? Yeah, like, it, it, it's just, it's weird. Hey, so this is so interesting because, you know, I, I've, I've had so many conversations recently with people talking about the, the Tea Party. And, and I think it's legitimate to say, in retrospect, what was the Tea Party all about since they have become so Trump? And I think part of that's the grift culture and the, the you know, the, the way in which they became part of the outrage mach- machine. Others say, well, it was just because there was a black president. But your point, I think, is really important. There was a moment of real genuine introspection and a desire to say, OK, what do we actually stand for? What are our principles? And that really was an interesting moment. And that is completely gone now because there is not there's no room for that debate, that discussion um, about about ideas, because it is basically why bother since we're all Trumpists? Now, of course, there is the effort, you know, Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, all trying to put on their sort of Trump masks, um, you know, pretending that they have some sort of, you know, deep ideas. But I guess my, my, my sense is that that's all sort of just like, you know, dr- dr- dressing up as Donald Trump rather than engaging in some sort of a serious um, intellectual reevaluation of what, where the party should go. What, what's your take? You no, know, I'm with you for the most part. Uh, I, I do think that, you know, to give a little bit of credit, I do think that that a guy like Rubio is, uh, you know, for as often as he will uh, sort of do say things on social media and pick fights that are like totally counterproductive and that just leave him looking like a shell of his former self. I do think that Rubio in the Senate on certain issues and particularly on China is uh, is really being pretty deliberate and, and pretty savvy in trying to get ahead of where not just the party is going, but where the country is going and where there are going to be some sort of major fault lines politically in future years. And, and he's uh, he, he's smart to do that. But but yeah, by and large, look, there's not introspection, Charlie, because introspection is dangerous, right? Introspection. I mean, look at Jeff Flake, right? Jeff Flake yeah. comes out and endorses Joe Biden yesterday. I, the, the, the thing lost in this that a lot of people aren't going to fully appreciate, Jeff Flake's best friend for his entire life in politics is the vice president of the United States. And Jeff Flake just came out and Mm. endorsed his opponent. Jeff Flake just came out and betrayed his best friend because he's so disturbed with the state of his party, right? And why did he do that? I would say, having covered Flake a while and, and kind of knowing how he thinks a little bit, I mean, that's a direct result of introspection, right? Yeah. Flake Flake was kind of courageous enough and honest enough to take a step back, look around and say, whoa, 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 this is not right. This is, this is messed up. I did not sign up for this and neither did you guys. We should do something about it. And of course, he lost his job over it. And so did Mark Sanford. And so did Justin Amash. And, and, and you know, these guys... They were introspective and look where it got them. Yeah. So I think for, for, for most of these people, and I've made this point before, but I can't emphasize it enough. Like, you know, p- people would ask, um, you know, when Paul Ryan was speaker, they would ask, like, how does this guy, you know, wake up and look in the mirror in the morning? Like, how does he live with himself? And I would try and explain, like, you have to, you guys, you got to understand, like, people like Paul Ryan in that position while he's speaker of the house, he's not logging on to Twitter. He's not watching MSNBC. He's doing the best he can to block out a lot of that noise because he doesn't, I mean, ignorance is bliss. You don't want to think about it. You don't want to see it. You don't want to be forced into a position where you are doing that sort of introspection and soul searching because it's going to lead you to some pretty dangerous conclusions. All right. I want want to get to uh, what the Democrats are doing and what they might be missing um, and also last night's convention. But there's there are so many good lines in this piece, which I strongly urge everybody to read because there's so much in here Um, where you write that at issue 
is not simply the constant enabling and justifying of the president's conduct by GOP officials, which now seems like kind of an old story, but also the rate at which copycats and clones are emerging. And I think this is another thing that is important about the Republican Party is the fact that you are seeing, you know, people like, you know, Kelly Ward being the chairman of the party in Arizona or Alan West uh, down in Texas. You have, you know, people who are winning primaries despite the fact that there are QAnon supporters. And I think it extends to the media as well. Um, and I'm trying not to be too unkind here, but. I, I just I can't help but notice just the dumbing down of the day to day language of conservative activists, you know, that everything has been reduced to sort of, you know, Trumpian tropes. So, I mean, just talk to me a little bit about how, you know, that that has happened. It's it's not just the 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 enabling, as you point out. There are a lot of other folks who basically have taken their cues from Donald Trump. He's been a massive a massive role model for so many people on the right yeah of course he has and the irony of course <laughs> Charlie with with Trump becoming a role model is that what you would hear from so many Republicans uh, during his rise in 2016 and after he won the presidency when you would ask about that kind of moral component of of American political leadership and whether it's important for the president to be a role model as Republicans long insisted that it had been, particularly during the, the Clinton impeachment trial, they'd say, well, you know, we kind of, we've been sort of been through that and I'm not sure he really needs to be a role model. I'm not sure that that's as important anymore. And there was, there was this very shrewd downplaying of this notion that Trump needed to be a role model, that, 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 that the country was in trouble and that they didn't need somebody who was going to, you know, set a great example. They needed somebody who was going to roll up his sleeves and get in there and, and, and rattle some cages and fix some problems, even if that meant offending people along the way. What's, what's so fascinating, though, to your point, is that he has become a role model just in a very backward sort of way. Right. He's not a role model that you want your kids watching on television. He's not a role model for your marriage. He's not a role model as a as a uh, as an upstanding businessman. Right. But he's a role model in the sense of creating a blueprint for how to disrupt. And demagogue and uh, sort of create conflict in a way that is politically advantageous and to inspire through outrage and to really build a an enormous following with lies. I mean, that is Trump as a role model. And it's been pretty successful, actually. I mean, you're not yeah. seeing any small number of people follow that blueprint and follow it successfully. No, I, I, it, it, is, it is remarkable. So I... Uh, you asked the question, you admit in your in your article that you were asked, what does the Republican Party stand for? And you were somewhat stumped. So was Frank Lunds. I admit that when people ask me, what's the future of the Republican Party? What is the post-Trump Republican Party? My answer is I have I have no idea. <laughs> I just I, it's hard for me to think past it. But I mean, is the future of the Republican Party Don Jr.? Is it Paul Ryan? Is it Nikki Haley? Is it uh, is it Josh Hawley? What is it? What is it going to look like? I don't know. It's, I don't know if it's any one of those people. Uh, look, the, I, I it's alluded not to Paul this. Ryan. It's yeah. It's I, yeah. It's definitely not Paul Ryan. We can we can cross yeah. him off the list. Um, he. I mean, he's had enough of this. Uh, look, you know, Charlie. The thing is, I alluded to this earlier. The Trumpism isn't going away. No. Uh, I, at least not anytime soon. But the Trumpism also isn't enough. And the $64,000 question for anyone who's attempting to lead this party in the years to come is how do you marry the imperative of the pre-Trump mandate in the Republican Party? Remember the autopsy in this and this belief that based on numbers, right, that, that you could not win presidential elections, that you could not be a competitive national party by just relying overwhelmingly on white voters at the expense of of black and uh, of black and brown voters um, and that that I mean everybody wants to sort of suspend 
belief and suspend reality because of Trump's victory in 2016 and and think that somehow because he won by 77,744 votes in three <laughs> states, that that completely changed the underlying calculus there. And in fact, it didn't. I mean, Trump postponed the inevitable. And so the party is going to have to grapple with those demographic challenges. And I think just as significant as how do you reach out to minorities, it's how do you keep college educated whites from this exodus that they are now uh, in the middle of. You know, these people have been Republicans for 50 years reliably, and they are fleeing from the party right now. And how do you, so how do you keep them as a part of the coalition? And it's a long way of saying, I don't know what that looks like. I, I, I just, I don't know who is going to be smart enough and savvy enough and politically gifted enough to marry these two very, very different and in some ways contradictory instincts of stoking that Trump that that Trump style populism while also heeding the warnings of that autopsy, which say very clearly that we, that, that 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 the party's current course is unsustainable in its with its inability to broaden its appeal and build out a bigger tent for more Americans to come under. Yeah, so you don't think that last night's convention attempt to reach out to African Americans is going to do the trick? Something tells me it's not. Although, yeah. look, in all seriousness, I would say that you know Tim Scott gave what I think was easily the best speech of the night, and it was a glimpse, Charlie. I mean, you know, in the middle of the circus with Matt Gates and Charlie Kirk and all these other characters, Kimberly Guilfoyle um, doing whatever she was doing. You know, Tim Scott gives this really, really heartfelt moving speech where he's talking about the you know what he has overcome personally and what his family has overcome and and how you know this is the first black person the only black person in the history of this country to serve in both the house and the senate i mean it's remarkable what he has been able to do and for a few minutes there as you're listening to him you're almost tempted to forget about everything else that you just saw in the previous 2 hours leading up to his speech right and so there are beacons of light that that can be seen but that light has been drowned out by an awful lot of darkness yeah and it's going to be eclipsed in the next three days by all the trumpets so okay you're in michigan right i'm in wisconsin yep so we have a slightly different perspective than the than the coastal elites on this um i i thought the democratic convention was relatively successful but i want to get your reaction to this um they did not seem to focus a lot on working class americans they used to be the democratic base and i heard very little discussion about the problem of crime or urban disorder things that we're hearing a lot about from the republicans do you think the democrats um, made a mistake by not talking to some of those uh, disaffected voters and not addressing the issue of American carnage more directly? Yeah, I do. I'm glad you asked. Uh, I, I do. Look, I think that I think the uh, sort of mantra of the Democratic Convention happened to align pretty much completely with the mantra of the Biden campaign, which is do no harm, right? right. Like don't don't ruffle feathers, don't rock the boat, don't create any controversies, don't hand any any ammunition to Trump's campaign. And so that dictated a lot of the, the uh, of the style and the theme and so it wasn't surprising to me that they didn't want to get into, you know, the the social unrest and the violence on the streets. Um, but I was, you know, I, I still think that they could have done it in a way that was uh, nuanced and 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 really reassuring to some of those suburban voters who hate Trump and who are really just on the edge of leaving the Republican Party, but who are also pretty freaked out by some of what they're seeing on the nightly news. I think there could have been a a way for Democrats to thread that needle and talk openly and candidly about the need for law enforcement yeah. and, and the need for communities to be respectful and responsible at times of crisis, while also projecting you know, great empathy and concern for afflicted, uh, afflicted communities and marginalized people. Like you can do both, right? Like this shouldn't be so. a false choice. Uh, and yet both parties aren't very good at, at, at doing it. Um, but I, I also think, Charlie, to your point, what was really surprising to me was the total lack or, or, or the almost total lack of 
any real presence there for the the union man, the blue collar worker. I mean, this was the backbone of the Democratic Party for generations. And I understand that we're in the middle of a huge realignment right now, and it's not as relevant as it used to be. But it almost smacked of the same arrogance that Hillary Clinton's campaign was so guilty of in 2016, where they believed, you know what, let them go. We don't need those voters. I mean, they're, you know, they're not statistically significant enough for us anymore because we see the same demographic writing on the wall that the Republicans do, and we don't need these folks as a part of our coalition. We can win without them. Is that the decision that they, in fact, have made, that they think that they're going to prioritize going for suburban women as opposed to trying to win back some of those blue-collar voters who had gone for Trump? I mean, was that a, is that a conscious decision? That's a that's a tough question to answer, and and because there's, it's also there's not a uniform answer to it. So I would say at the national level, it's probably more. I, I think that that attitude is more prevalent at the national level, and uh, certainly, you know, uh, you know, f- f- inside the Beltway and at the party committees and uh, in the big lobby shops. Uh, you know, the the professional political democratic class in Washington, I think, is much more of that belief than are some of the more moderate democratic lawmakers, particularly in this freshman class in the House, who I think are very attentive to the concerns of those voters and who have really uh, made an effort to not pursue that suburban upper class, two car garage, college educated voter at the expense of that blue collar working class voter who in many cases lives just like seven or eight miles away, right? Like there's, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these districts now, these purple districts have like the exurban and the suburban and the rural are sort of all running up against each other. And, you know, I think most Democrats, you know, if for no other reason than because of necessity, they know that they can't afford to just like completely write off this one group of voters in the way that some at the national level have been guilty of. No, I and of course, they still have plenty of time. And and, 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 Joe, and Joe Biden has certain advantages in being able to do that that other candidates do not. Tim Alberta, thank you so much. I know that you are very, very busy these days. This is an incredible piece. It's a it is a long read, but uh, every word is uh, sort of written like, you know, fire ink. The Grand Old Meltdown, What Happens When a Party Gives Up on Ideas in Politico magazine. Uh, Very grateful for uh, coming back on the podcast, uh, Tim. Charlie, always got time for you, man. Thanks. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again. There are now just 69 days to go until the election.